Preface of The History of Genghis Khan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott. Preface The word Khan is not a name, but a title. It means chieftain or king. It is a word used in various forms by the different tribes and nations that from time immemorial have inhabited Central Asia, and has been applied to a great number of potentates and rulers that have from time to time arisen among them. Genghis Khan was the greatest of these princes. He was, in fact, one of the most renowned conquerors whose exploits history records. As in all other cases occurring in the series of histories to which this work belongs, where the events narrated took place at such a period or in such a part of the world that positively reliable and authentic information in respect to them can now no longer be obtained. The author is not responsible for the actual truth of the narrative which he offers, but only for the honesty and fidelity with which he has compiled it from the best sources of information now within reach. End of preface. Chapter 1 of The History of Genghis Khan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 1. Pastoral Life in Asia. Four Different Modes of Life Enumerated. There are four several methods by which the various communities into which the human race is divided obtain their subsistence from the productions of the earth each of which leads to its own peculiar system of social organization, distinct in its leading characteristics from those of all the rest. Each tends to its own peculiar form of government, gives rise to its own manners and customs, and forms, in a word, a distinctive and characteristic type of life. These methods are the following. 1. By hunting wild animals in a state of nature. 2 by rearing tame animals in pasturages, three, by gathering fruits and vegetables, which grow spontaneously in a state of nature, four, by rearing fruits and grains and other vegetables, by artificial tillage in cultivated ground. By the two former methods, man subsists on animal food, by the two latter, on vegetable food. Northern and Southern Climes animal food in arctic regions as we go north from the temperate regions toward the poles man is found to subsist more and more on animal food this seems to be the intention of providence in the arctic regions scarcely any vegetables grow that are fit for human food but animals whose flesh is nutritious and adapted to the use of man are abundant as we go south from temperate regions toward the equator, man is found to subsist more and more on vegetable food. This, too, seems to be the intention of nature. Within the tropics, scarcely any animals live that are fit for human food, while fruits, roots, and other vegetable productions, which are nutritious and adapted to the use of man, are abundant. In accordance with this difference in the productions of the different regions of the earth, there seems to be a difference in the constitutions of the races of men formed to inhabit them. The tribes that inhabit Greenland and Camp Shotka cannot preserve their accustomed health and vigor on any other than animal food. If put upon a diet of vegetables, they soon begin to pine away. The reverse is true of the vegetable eaters of the tropics. They preserve their health and strength well on a diet of rice or breadfruit or bananas and would undoubtedly be made sick by being fed on the flesh of walruses seals and white bears tropical regions 
appetite changes with climate in the temperate regions the productions of the above-mentioned extremes are mingled here many animals whose flesh is fit for human food live and thrive and here grows too a vast variety of nutritious fruits and roots and seeds the physical constitution of the various races of men that inhabit these regions is modified accordingly in the temperate climes men can live on vegetable food or on animal food or on both the constitution differs too in different individuals and it changes at different periods of the year some persons require more of animal and others more of vegetable food to preserve their bodily and mental powers in the best condition and each one observes a change in himself in passing from winter to summer in the summer the desire for a diet of fruits and vegetables seems to come northward with the sun and in the winter the appetite for flesh comes southward from the arctic regions with the cold when we consider the different conditions in which the different regions of the earth are placed in respect to their capacity of production for animal and vegetable food we shall see that this adjustment of the constitution of man both to the differences of climate and to the changes of the seasons is a very wise and beneficent arrangement of divine providence to confine man absolutely either to animal or vegetable food would be to depopulate a large part of the earth first steps towards civilization it results from these general facts in respect to the distribution of the supplies of animal and vegetable food for man in different latitudes that in all northern climes in our hemisphere men living in a savage state must be hunters while those that live near the equator must depend for their subsistence on fruits and roots growing wild when moreover any tribe or race of men in either of these localities take the first steps towards civilization they begin in the one case by taming animals and rearing them in flocks and herds and in the other case by saving the seeds of food producing plants and cultivating them by artificial tillage in enclosed and private fields this last is the condition of all the half-civilized tribes of the tropical regions of the earth whereas the former prevails in all the northern temperate and arctic regions as far to the northward as domesticated animals can live interior of asia pastoral habits of the people from time immemorial the whole interior of the continent of asia has been inhabited by tribes and nations that have taken this one step in the advance towards civilization but have gone no farther they live not like the indians in north america by hunting wild beasts but by rearing and pasturing flocks and herds of animals that they have tamed these animals feed of course on grass and herbage and as grass and herbage can only grow on open ground the forests have gradually disappeared and the country has for ages consisted of great grassy plains or of smooth hillsides covered with verdure over these plains or along the river valleys wander the different tribes of which these pastoral nations are composed living in tents or in frail huts almost equally movable and driving their flocks and herds before them from one pasture ground to another according as the condition of the grass or that of the springs and streams of water may require picture of pastoral life we obtain a pretty distinct idea of the nature of this pastoral life and of the manners and customs and the domestic constitution to which it gives rise in the accounts given us in the old testament of abraham and lot and of their wanderings with their flocks and herds over the country lying between the euphrates and the mediterranean sea they lived in tents in order that they might remove their habitations the more easily from place to place in following their flocks and herds to different pasture grounds their wealth consisted almost wholly in these flocks and herds the land being almost everywhere common sometimes when two parties traveling together came to a fertile and well-watered district their herdsmen and followers were disposed to contend for the privilege of feeding their flocks upon it 
and the contention would often lead to a quarrel and combat if it had not been settled by an amicable agreement on the part of the chieftains large families accumulated the father of a family was the legislator and ruler of it and his sons with their wives and his sons sons remained with him sometimes for many years sharing his means of subsistence submitting to his authority and going with him from place to place with all his flocks and herds they employed too so many herdsmen and other servants and followers as to form in many cases quite an extended community and sometimes in case of hostilities with any other wandering tribe a single patriarch could send forth from his own domestic circle a force of several hundred armed men such a company as this when moving across the country on its way from one region of pasturage to another appeared like an immense caravan on its march and when settled at an encampment the tents formed quite a little town rise of patriarchal governments whenever the head of one of these wandering families died the tendency was not for the members of the community to separate but to keep together and allow the oldest son to take the father's place as chieftain and ruler this was necessary for defense and of course such communities as these were in perpetual danger of coming into collision with other communities roaming about like themselves over the same regions it would necessarily result too from the circumstances of the case that a strong and well-managed party with an able and sagacious chieftain at the head of it would attract other and weaker parties to join it or on the arising of some pretext for a quarrel would make war upon it and conquer it thus in process of time small nations as it were would be formed which would continue united and strong as long as the able leadership continued and then they would separate into their original elements which elements would be formed again into other combinations origin of the towns such substantially was pastoral life in the beginning in process of time of course the tribes banded together became larger and larger some few towns and cities were built as places for the manufacture of implements and arms or as resting places for the caravans of merchants in conveying from place to place such articles as were bought and sold but these places were comparatively few and unimportant a pastoral and roaming life continued to be the destiny of the great mass of the people and this state of things which was commenced on the banks of the euphrates before the time of abraham spread through the whole breadth of asia from the mediterranean sea to the pacific ocean and has continued with very little change from those early periods to the present time great chieftains genghis khan of the various chieftains that have from time to time risen to command among these shepherd nations but little is known for very few and very scanty records have been kept of the history of any of them some of them have been famous as conquerors and have acquired very extended dominions the most celebrated of all is perhaps genghis khan the hero of this history he came upon the stage more than three thousand years after the time of the great prototype of his class the patriarch abraham end of chapter one chapter two of the history of genghis khan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 2. The Mongols. Mongols, Origin of the Name. Three thousand years is a period of time long enough to produce great changes, and in the course of that time a great many different nations and congeries of nations were formed in the regions of Central Asia. The term Tartars has been employed generically to denote almost the whole race the mongols are a portion of this people who are said to derive their name from mongol khan one of their earliest and most powerful chieftains the descendants of this khan called themselves by his name 
just as the descendants of the twelve sons of jacob called themselves israelites or children of israel from the name israel which was one of the designations of the great patriarch from whose twelve sons the twelve tribes of the jews descended the country inhabited by the mongols was called mongolia a mongol family to obtain a clear conception of a single mongol family you must imagine first a rather small short thick-set man with long black hair a flat face and a dark olive complexion his wife if her face were not so flat and her nose so broad would be quite a brilliant little beauty her eyes are so black and sparkling the children have much the appearance of young indians as they run shouting among the cattle on the hillsides or if young playing half naked about the door of the hut their long black hair streaming in the wind their occupations like all the rest of the inhabitants of central asia these people depended almost entirely for their subsistence on the products of their flocks and herds of course their great occupation consisted in watching their animals while feeding by day and in putting them in places of security by night in taking care of and rearing the young in making butter and cheese from the milk and clothing from the skins in driving the cattle to and fro in search of pasturage and finally in making war on the people of other tribes to settle disputes arising out of conflicting claims to territory or to replenish their stock of sheep and oxen by seizing and driving off the flocks of their neighbors animals of the mongols the animals which the mongols most prized were camels oxen and cows sheep goats and horses they were very proud of their horses and they rode them with great courage and spirit they always went mounted in going to war their arms were bows and arrows pikes or spears and a sort of sword or sabre which was manufactured in some of the towns toward the west and supplied to them in the course of trade by great travelling caravans their towns and villages although the mass of the people lived in the open country with their flocks and herds there were notwithstanding a great many towns and villages though such centres of population were much fewer and less important among them than they are in countries the inhabitants of which live by tilling the ground some of these towns were the residences of the khans and the heads of tribes others were places of manufacture or centres of commerce and many of them were fortified with embankments of earth or walls of stone the habitations of the common people even those built in the towns were rude huts made so as to be easily taken down and removed the tents were made by means of poles set in a circle in the ground and brought nearly together at the top so as to form a frame similar to that of an indian wigwam a hoop was placed near the top of these poles so as to preserve a round opening there for the smoke to go out the frame was then covered with sheets of a sort of thick gray felt so placed as to leave the opening within the hoop free the felt too was arranged below in such a manner that the corner of one of the sheets could be raised and let down again to form a sort of door the edges of the sheets in other places were fastened together very carefully especially in winter to keep out the cold air within the tent on the ground in the centre the family built their fire which was made of sticks leaves grass and dried droppings of all sorts gathered from the ground for the country produced scarcely any wood countries roamed over by herds of animals that gain their living by pasturing on the grass and herbage are almost always destitute of trees trees in such a case have no opportunity to grow bad fuel comfortless homes the tents of the mongols thus made were of course very comfortless homes they could not be kept warm there was so much cold air coming continually in through the crevices notwithstanding all the people's contrivances to make them tight the smoke too did not all escape through the hoop hole above much of it remained in the tent and mingled with the atmosphere this evil was aggravated by the kind of fuel which they used which was of such a nature that it made only a sort of smouldering fire instead of burning 
like good dry wood with a bright and clear flame the discomforts of these huts and tents were increased by the custom which prevailed among the people of allowing the animals to come into them especially those that were young and feeble and to live there with the family movable houses built at last the painting in process of time as the people increased in riches and in mechanical skill some of the more wealthy chieftains began to build houses so large and so handsome that they could not be conveniently taken down to be removed and then they contrived a way of mounting them upon trucks placed at the four corners and moving them bodily in this way across the plains as a table is moved across a floor upon its casters it was necessary of course that the houses should be made very light in order to be managed in this way they were in fact still tents rather than houses being made of the same materials only they were put together in a more substantial and ornamental manner the frame was made of very light poles though these poles were fitted together in permanent joinings the covering was like that of the tents made of felt but the sheets were joined together by close and strong seams and the whole was coated with a species of paint which not only closed all the pores and interstices and made the structure very tight but also served to ornament it for they were accustomed in painting these houses to adorn the covering with pictures of birds beasts and trees representing in such a manner as doubtless in their eyes produced a very beautiful effect account of a large movable house these movable houses were sometimes very large a certain traveller who visited the country not far from the time of genghis khan says that he saw one of these structures in motion which was thirty feet in diameter it was drawn by twenty-two oxen it was so large that it extended five feet on each side beyond the wheels the oxen in drawing it were not attached as with us to the centre of the forward axle-tree but to the ends of the axle-trees which projected beyond the wheels on each side there were eleven oxen on each side drawing upon the axle-trees there were of course many drivers the one who was chief in command stood in the door of the tent or house which looked forward and there with many loud shouts and flourishing gesticulations issued his orders to the oxen and to the other men the traveling chests the household goods of this traveling chieftain were packed in chests made for the purpose the house itself of course in order to be made as light as possible having been emptied of all its contents these chests were large and were made of wicker or basket work covered like the house with felt the covers were made of a rounded form so as to throw off the rain and the felt was painted over with a certain composition which made it impervious to the water these chests were not intended to be unpacked at the end of the journey but to remain as they were as permanent storehouses of utensils clothing and provisions they were placed in rows each on its own cart near the tent where they could be resorted to conveniently from time to time by the servants and attendants as occasion might require the tent placed in the centre with these great chests on their carts near it formed as it were a house with one great room standing by itself and all the little rooms and closets arranged in rows by the side of it necessity of such an arrangement some such arrangement as this is obviously necessary in case of a great deal of furniture or baggage belonging to a man who lives in a tent and who desires to be at liberty to remove his whole establishment from place to place at short notice for a tent from the very principle of its construction is incapable of being divided into rooms or of accommodating extensive stores of furniture or goods of course a special contrivance is required for the accommodation of this species of property this was especially the case with the mongols among whom there were many rich and great men who often accumulated a large amount of movable property there was one rich mongol it was said who had two hundred such chest carts which were arranged in two rows around and behind his tent so that his establishment when he was encamped looked like quite a little village 
houses in the towns the style of building adopted among the mongols for tents and movable houses seemed to set the fashion for all their houses even for those that were built in the towns and were meant to stand permanently where they were first set up these permanent houses were little better than tents they consisted each of one single room without any subdivisions whatever they were made round too like the tents only the top instead of running up to a point was rounded like a dome there were no floors above that formed on the ground and no windows roads over the plains such was the general character of the dwellings of the mongols in the days of genghis khan they took their character evidently from the wandering and pastoral life that the people led one would have thought that very excellent roads would have been necessary to have enabled them to draw the ponderous carts containing their dwellings and household goods but this was less necessary than might have been supposed on account of the nature of the country which consisted chiefly of immense grassy plains and smooth river valleys over which in many places wheels would travel tolerably well in any direction without much making of roadway then again in all such countries the people who journeyed from place to place and the herds of cattle that moved to and fro naturally fall into the same lines of travel and thus in time wear great trails as cows make paths in a pasture these with a little artificial improvement at certain points make very good summer roads and in the winter it is not necessary to use them at all tribes and families the mongols like the ancient jews were divided into tribes and these were subdivided into families a family meaning in this connection not one household but a large congeries of households including all those that were of known relationship to each other these groups of relatives had each its head and the tribe to which they pertained had also its general head there were it is said three sets of these tribes forming three grand divisions of the mongol people each of which was ruled by its own khan and then to complete the system there was the grand khan who ruled over all influence of diversity of pursuits a constitution of society like this almost always prevails in pastoral countries and we shall see on a little reflection that it is natural that it should do so in a country like ours where the pursuits of men are so infinitely diversified the descendants of different families become mingled together in the most promiscuous manner the son of a farmer in one state goes off as soon as he is of age to some other state to find a place among merchants or manufacturers because he wishes to be a merchant or a manufacturer himself while his father supplies his place on the farm perhaps by hiring a man who likes farming and has come hundreds of miles in search of work thus the descendants of one american grandfather and grandmother will be found after a lapse of a few years scattered in every direction all over the land and indeed sometimes all over the world it is the diversity of pursuits which prevails in such a country as ours taken in connection with the diversity of capacity and of taste in different individuals that produces this dispersion tribes and clans among a people devoted wholly to pastoral pursuits all this is different the young men as they grow up can have generally no inducement to leave their homes they continue to live with their parents and relatives sharing the care of the flocks and herds and making common cause with them in everything that is of common interest it is thus that those great family groups are formed which exist in all pastoral countries under the name of tribes or clans and form the constituent elements of the whole social and political organization of the people mode of making war horsemen the bow and arrow in case of general war each tribe of the mongols furnished of course a certain quota of armed men in proportion to its numbers and strength these men always went to war as has already been said on horseback and the spectacle which these troops presented in galloping in squadrons over the plains was sometimes very imposing the shock of the onset when they charged in this way upon the enemy was tremendous 
They were armed with bows and arrows and also with sabers. As they approached the enemy, they discharged first a shower of arrows upon him, while they were in the act of advancing at the top of their speed. Then, dropping their bows by their side, they would draw their sabers and be ready as soon as the horses fell upon the enemy to cut down all opposed to them with the most furious and deadly blows if they were repulsed and compelled by a superior force to retreat they would gallop at full speed over the plains turning at the same time in their saddles and shooting at their pursuers with their arrows as coolly and with as correct an aim almost as if they were still while thus retreating the trooper would guide and control his horse by his voice and by the pressure of his heels upon his sides so as to have both his arms free for fighting his pursuers these arrows were very formidable weapons it is said one of the travellers who visited the country in those days says that they could be shot with so much force as to pierce the body of a man entirely through the flying horseman nature of the bow and arrow it must be remembered however in respect to all such statements relating to the efficiency of the bow and arrow that the force with which an arrow can be thrown depends not upon any independent action of the bow but altogether upon the strength of the man who draws it the bow in straightening itself for the propulsion of the arrow expends only the force which the man has imparted to it by bending it so that the real power by which the arrow is propelled is after all the muscular strength of the archer it is true a great deal depends on the qualities of the bow and also on the skill of the man in using it to make all this muscular strength effective with a poor bow or with unskilled management a great deal of it would be wasted but with the best possible bow and with the most consummate skill of the archer it is the strength of the archer's arm which throws the arrow after all superiority of firearms it is very different in this respect with a bullet thrown by the force of gunpowder from the barrel of a gun the force in this case is the explosive force of the powder and the bullet is thrown to the same distance whether it is a very weak man or a very strong man that pulls the trigger sources of information gog and magog but to return to the mongols all the information which we can obtain in respect to the condition of the people before the time of genghis khan comes to us from the reports of travelers who either as merchants or as ambassadors from caliphs or kings made long journeys into these distant regions and have left records more or less complete of their adventures and accounts of what they saw in writings which have been preserved by the learned men of the east it is very doubtful how far these accounts are to be believed one of these travellers a learned man named salam who made a journey far into the interior of asia by order of the caliph mohammed amin billah some time before the reign of genghis khan says that among other objects of research and investigation which occupied his mind he was directed to ascertain the truth in respect to the two famous nations gog and magog or as they are designated in his account yegog and magog the story that had been told of these two nations by the arabian writers and which was extensively believed was that the people of yegog were of the ordinary size of men but those of magog were only about two feet high these people had made war upon the neighboring nations and had destroyed many cities and towns but had at last been overpowered and shut up in prison salam adventures of salam and his party salam the traveller whom the caliph sent to ascertain whether their accounts were true travelled at the head of a caravan containing fifty men and with camels bearing stores and provisions for a year he was gone a long time when he came back he gave an account of his travels and in respect to gog and magog he said that he had found that the accounts which had been heard respecting them were true he travelled on he said from the country of one chieftain to another till he reached the caspian sea and then went on beyond that sea for thirty or forty days more 
in one place the party came to a tract of low black land which exhaled an odor so offensive that they were obliged to use perfumes all the way to overpower the noxious smells they were ten days in crossing this fetid territory after this they went on a month longer through a desert country and at length came to a fertile land which was covered with the ruins of cities that the people of gog and magog had destroyed in six days more they reached the country of the nation by which the people of gog and magog had been conquered and shut up in prison here they found a great many strong castles there was a large city here too containing temples and academies of learning and also the residence of the king the wonderful mountain great bolts and bars the travelers took up their abode in this city for a time and while they were there they made an excursion of two days journey into the country to see the place where the people of gog and magog were confined when they arrived at the place they found a lofty mountain there was a great opening made in the face of this mountain two or three hundred feet wide the opening was protected on each side by enormous buttresses between which was placed an immense double gate the buttresses and the gate being all of iron the buttresses were surmounted with an iron bulwark and with lofty towers also of iron which were carried up as high as to the top of the mountain itself the gates were of the width of the opening cut in the mountain and were seventy-five feet high and the valves lintels and threshold and also the bolts the lock and the key were all of proportional size the prisoners salem on arriving at the place saw all these wonderful structures with his own eyes and he was told by the people there that it was the custom of the governor of the castles already mentioned to take horse every friday with ten others and coming to the gate to strike the great bolt three times with a ponderous hammer weighing five pounds when there would be heard a murmuring noise within which were the groans of the yagog and magog people confined in the mountain indeed salem was told that the poor captives often appeared on the battlements above thus the real existence of this people was in his opinion fully proved and even the story in respect to the diminutive size of the magogs was substantiated for salem was told that once in a high wind three of them were blown off from the battlements to the ground and that on being measured they were found but three spans high travelers tales progress of intelligence this is a specimen of the tales brought home from remote countries by the most learned and accomplished travelers of those times in comparing these absurd and ridiculous tales with the reports which are brought back from distant regions in our days by such travelers as humboldt livingstone and kane we shall perceive what an immense progress in intelligence and information the human mind has made since those days End of chapter 2chapter three of the history of genghis khan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the history of genghis khan by jacob abbott chapter three yezankai khan 1163 to 1175 yezankai bahadur the name of the father of Genghis Khan is a word which cannot be pronounced exactly in English. It sounded something like this, Yezankai Bahadur, with the accent on the last syllable, Bahadur, and the A sounded like A in Hark. This was as near as we can come to it. But the name, as it was really pronounced by the Mongol people, cannot be written in English letters nor spoken with English sounds orthography of mongol names indeed in all languages so entirely distinct from each other as the mongol language was from ours the sounds are different and the letters by which the sounds are represented are different too some of the sounds are so utterly unlike any sounds that we have in english 
that it is as impossible to write them in english characters as it is for us to write in english letters the sound that a man makes when he chirps to his horse or his dog or when he whistles sometimes writers attempt to represent the latter sound by the word hu and when in reading a dialogue we come to the word hu inserted to express a part of what one of the speakers uttered we understand by it that he whistled but how different after all is the sound of the spoken word hu from the whistling sound that it is intended to represent great diversities now in all the languages of asia there are many sounds as impossible to be rendered by the european letters as this and in making the attempt every different writer falls into a different mode thus the first name of genghis khan's father is spelled by different travellers and historians yazankai yesuke yesuki yazugi bisuke bisuke pisuke and in several other ways the real sound was undoubtedly as different from any of these as they were all different from each other in this narrative i shall adopt the first of these methods and call him yazanke bahadur yazanke's power a successful warrior yazanke was a great khan and he descended in a direct line through ten generations so it was said from a deity great sovereigns in those countries and times were very fond of tracing back their descent to some divine origin by way of establishing more fully in the minds of the people their divine right to the throne yezonke's residence was at a great palace in the country called by a name the sound of which as nearly as it can be represented in english letters was dilo neldak from this his capital he used to make warlike excursions at the head of hordes of mongols into the surrounding countries in the prosecution of quarrels which he made with them under various pretexts and as he was a skilful commander and had great influence in inducing all the inferior khans to bring large troops of men from their various tribes to add to his army he was usually victorious and in this way he extended his empire very considerably while he lived and thus made a very good preparation for the subsequent exploits of his son Kate. the northern part of china was at that time entirely separated from the southern part and was under a different government it constituted an entirely distinct country and was called Kate. this country was under the dominion of a chieftain called the khan of Kate. this khan was very jealous of the increasing power of Yezanke and took part against him in all his wars with the tribes around him and assisted them in their attempts to resist him but he did not succeed Yezanke was too powerful for them and went on extending his conquests far and wide at last under the pretense of some affront which he had received from them Yezanke made war upon a powerful tribe of tartars that lived in his neighborhood he invaded their territories at the head of an immense horde of mongol troops and began seizing and driving off their cattle the khan of temujin mongol custom birth of genghis khan the name of the khan who ruled over these people was temujin temujin assembled his forces as soon as he could and went to meet the invaders a great battle was fought and yezonkai was victorious Temujin was defeated and put to flight. Yezankai encamped after the battle on the banks of the river Amur near a mountain. He had all his family with him, for it was often the custom in these enterprises for the chieftain to take with him not only all his household, but a large portion of his household goods. Yezankai had several wives, and almost immediately after the battle, one of them, named Olin Aika, gave birth to a son. Yezanke, fresh from the battle, determined to commemorate his victory by giving his newborn son the name of his vanquished enemy. So he named him Temujin. His birth took place as nearly as can now be ascertained in the year of our Lord, 1163. Such were the circumstances of our hero's birth, for it was this Temujin 
who afterward became renowned throughout all asia under the name of genghis khan through all the early part of his life however he was always known by the name which his father gave him in the tent by the river side where he was born predictions of the astrologer among the other grand personages in yazankai's train at this time there was a certain old astrologer named sugujin he was a relative of yazankai and also his principal minister of state this man by his skill in astrology which he applied to the peculiar circumstances of the child foretold for him at once a wonderful career he would grow up the astrologer said to be a great warrior he would conquer all his enemies and extend his conquests so far that he would in the end become the khan of all tartary young temujin's parents were of course greatly pleased with these predictions and when not long after this time the astrologer died they appointed his son whose name was karasher to be the guardian and instructor of the boy they trusted it seems to the son to give the young prince such a training in early life as should prepare him to realize the grand destiny which the father had foretold for him explanation of the predictions there would be something remarkable in the fact that these predictions were uttered at the birth of genghis khan since they were afterwards so completely fulfilled were it not that similar prognostications of greatness and glory were almost always offered to the fathers and mothers of young princes in those days by the astrologers and soothsayers of their courts such promises were of course very flattering to these parents at the time and brought those who made them into great favor then in the end if the result verified them they were remembered and recorded as something wonderful if not they were forgotten karasher education of temujin karasher the astrologer's son who had been appointed young temujin's tutor took his pupil under his charge and began to form plans for educating him karasher was a man of great talents and of considerable attainments in learning so far as there could be anything like learning in such a country and among such a people he taught him the names of the various tribes that lived in the countries around and the names of the principal chieftains that ruled over them he also gave him such information as he possessed in respect to the countries themselves describing the situation of the mountains the lakes and the rivers and the great deserts which here and there intervened between the fertile regions he taught him moreover to ride and trained him in all such athletic exercises as were practiced by the youth of those times he instructed him also in the use of arms teaching him how to shoot with a bow and arrow and how to hold and handle his saber both when on horseback and when on foot he particularly instructed him in the art of shooting his arrow in any direction when riding at a gallop upon his horse behind as well as before and to the right side as well as to the left to do this coolly skillfully and with a true aim required great practice as well as much courage and presence of mind his precocity young temujin entered into all these things with great spirit indeed he very soon ceased to feel any interest in anything else so that by the time that he was nine years of age it was said that he thought of nothing but exercising himself in the use of arms his early marriage nine years of age however with him was more than it would be with a young man among us for the asiatics arrive at maturity much earlier than the nations of western europe and america indeed by the time that temujin was thirteen years old his father considered him a man at least he considered him old enough to be married he was married in fact and had two children before he was fifteen if the accounts which the historians have given us respecting him are true just before temujin was thirteen his father in one of his campaigns in Catay, was defeated in a battle and although a great many of his followers escaped he himself was surrounded and overpowered by the horsemen of the enemy and was made prisoner he was put under the care of a guard for of course among people living almost altogether on horseback and in tents 
there could be very few prisons. Yezonkai followed the camp of his conqueror for some time under the custody of his guard, but at length he succeeded in bribing his keeper to let him escape, and so contrived, after encountering many difficulties and suffering many hardships, to make his way back to his own country. Plans of Temujin's Father Karazu Tayyan he was determined now to make a new incursion into Katay, and that with a larger force than he had had before. So he made an alliance with the chieftain of a neighboring tribe called the Naimans, and in order to seal and establish this alliance, he contracted that his son should marry the daughter of his ally. This was the time when Temujin was but thirteen years old. The name of this, his first wife, was Karazu at least that was one of her names. Her father's name was Tayyan. Death of Yazanke. Before Yazanke had time to mature his plans for his new invasion of Kate, he fell sick and died. He left five sons and a daughter, it is said, but Temujin seems to have been the oldest of them all, for by his will his father left his kingdom, if the command of the group of tribes which were under his sway can be called a kingdom, to him, notwithstanding that he was yet only thirteen years old. End of chapter 3chapter four of the history of Genghis Khan. This is a LibriVox recording. A LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 4. The First Battle. 1175. In the language of the Mongols and of their neighbors the Tartars, the collection of tribes banded together under one chieftain was designated by a name which sounded like the word Orda. This is the origin, it is said, of the English word horde, Temujin's accession, discontent. The Orda over which Yezonkai had ruled, and the command of which, at his death, he left to his son, consisted of a great number of separate tribes, each of which had its own particular chieftain. All these subordinate chieftains were content to be under Yezonkai's rule and leadership while he lived. He was competent, they thought, to direct their movements and to lead them into battle against their enemies. But when he died, leaving only a young man, thirteen years of age, to succeed him, several of them were disposed to rebel. There were two of them in particular who thought that they were themselves better qualified to reign over the nation than such a boy, so they formed an alliance with each other and with such other tribes as were disposed to join them, and advanced to make war upon Temujin at the head of a great number of squadrons of troops, amounting in all to thirty thousand men. Teshot and Chamuka The names of the two leaders of this rebellion were Teshot and Chamuka. Young Temujin depended chiefly on his mother for guidance and direction in this emergency. He was himself very brave and spirited, but bravery and spirit, though they are of such vital importance in a commander on the field of battle, when the contest actually comes on, are by no means the principal qualities that are required in making the preliminary arrangements. Arrangements for the Battle Accordingly, Temujin left the forming of the plans to his mother, while he thought only of his horses, of his arms and equipments, and of the fury with which he would gallop in among the enemy when the time should arrive for the battle to begin. His mother, in connection with the chief officers of the army and counselors of state who were around her, and on whom her husband, Yazanke, during his lifetime, had been most accustomed to rely, arranged all the plans. They sent off messengers to the heads of all the tribes that they supposed would be friendly to Temujin, and appointed places of rendezvous for the troops that they were to send. They made arrangements for the stores of provisions which would be required, settled questions of precedence among the different clans, regulated the order of march, and attended to all other necessary details. Temujin's Ardor In the meantime, 
temujin thought only of the approaching battle he was engaged continually in riding up and down upon spirited horses and shooting in all directions backward and forward and both to the right side and to the left with his bow and arrow nor was all this exhibition of ardor on his part a mere useless display it had great influence in awakening a corresponding ardor among the chieftains of the troops and among the troops themselves they felt proud of the spirit and energy which their young prince displayed and were more and more resolved to exert themselves to the utmost in defending his cause porgy there was another young prince of the name of porgy of about temujin's age who was also full of ardor for the fight he was the chieftain of one of the tribes that remained faithful to temujin and he was equally earnest with temujin for the battle to begin exaggerated statements at length the troops were ready and with temujin and his mother at the head of them they went forth to attack the rebels the rebels were ready to receive them they were thirty thousand strong according to the statements of the historians this number is probably exaggerated as all numbers were in those days when there was no regular enrollment of troops and no strict system of enumeration the battle at any rate there was a very great battle immense troops of horsemen coming at full speed in opposite directions shot showers of arrows at each other when they arrived at the proper distance for the arrows to take effect and then throwing down their bows and drawing their sabres rushed madly on until they came together with an awful shock the dreadful confusion and terror of which no person can describe the air was filled with the most terrific outcries in which yells of fury shrieks of agony and shouts of triumph were equally mingled some of the troops maintained their position through the shock and rode on bearing down all before them others were overthrown and trampled in the dust while all both those who were up and those who were down were cutting in every direction with their sabres killing men and inciting the horses to redoubled fury by the wounds which they gave them bravery of temujin and porgy in the midst of such scenes as these temujin and porgy fought furiously with the rest temujin distinguished himself greatly it is probable that those who were immediately around him felt that he was under their charge and that they must do all in their power to protect him from danger this they could do much more easily and effectually under the mode of fighting which prevailed in those days than would be possible now when gunpowder is the principal agent of destruction temujin's attendants and followers could gather round him and defend him from assailants they could prevent him from charging any squadron which was likely to be strong enough to overpower him and they could keep his enemies so much at bay that they could not reach him with their sabres but upon a modern field of battle there is much less opportunity to protect a young prince or general's son or other personage whose life may be considered as peculiarly valuable no precautions of his attendants can prevent a bomb's bursting at his feet or shield him from the rifle balls that come whistling from such great distances through the air influence of temujin's example Tayshot slain the victory at any rate whether protected by his attendants or only by the fortune of war temujin passed through the battle without being hurt and the courage and energy which he displayed were greatly commended by all who witnessed them his mother was in the battle too though perhaps not personally involved in the actual conflicts of it she directed the maneuvers however and by her presence and her activity greatly encouraged and animated the men in consequence of the spirit and energy infused into the troops by her presence and by the extraordinary ardor and bravery of temujin the battle was gained the army of the enemy was put to flight one of the leaders Tayshot, was slain the other made his escape and temujin and his mother were left in possession of the field rewards and honors of course after having fought with so much energy and effect on such a field temujin was now no longer considered as a boy but took his place at once as a man among men 
and was immediately recognized by all the army as their prince and sovereign and as fully entitled by his capacity if not by his years to rule in his own name he assumed and exercised his powers with as much calmness and self-possession as if he had been accustomed to them for many years he made addresses to his officers and soldiers and distributed honors and rewards to them with a combined majesty and grace which in their opinion denoted much grandeur of soul the rewards and honors were characteristic of the customs of the country and the times they consisted of horses arms splendid articles of dress and personal ornaments of course among a people who lived as it were always on horseback such objects as these were the ones most highly prized temujin's rising fame the consequence of this victory was that nearly the whole country occupied by the rebels submitted without any farther resistance to temujin's sway other tribes who lived on the borders of his dominions sent in to propose treaties of alliance the khan of one of these tribes demanded of temujin the hand of his sister in marriage to seal and confirm the alliance which he proposed to make in a word the fame of temujin's prowess spread rapidly after the battle over all the surrounding countries and high anticipations began to be formed of the greatness and glory of his reign his second wife in the course of the next year temujin was married to his second wife although he was at this time only fourteen years old the name of his bride was purda kujin by this wife who was probably of about his own age he had a daughter who was born before the close of the year after the marriage purda carried away captive customary present in his journeys about the country temujin sometimes took his wives with him and sometimes he left them temporarily in some place of supposed security toward the end of the second year purda was again about to become a mother and temujin who at that time had occasion to go off on some military expedition fearing that the fatigue and exposure would be more than she could well bear left her at home while he was gone a troop of horsemen from a tribe of his enemies came suddenly into the district on a marauding expedition they overpowered the troops temujin had left to guard the place and seized and carried off everything that they could find that was valuable they made prisoner of purda too and carried her away a captive the plunder they divided among themselves but purda they sent as a present to a certain khan who reigned over a neighboring country and whose favor they wished to secure the name of this chieftain was vang khan as this vang khan figures somewhat conspicuously in the subsequent history of temujin a full account of him will be given in the next chapter all that is necessary to say here is that the intention of the captors of purda in sending her to him as a present was that he should make her his wife it was the custom of these khans to have as many wives as they could obtain so that when prisoners of high rank were taken in war if there were any young and beautiful women among them they were considered as charming presents to send to any great prince or potentate near whom the captors were desirous of pleasing it made no difference in such cases whether the person who was to receive the present were young or old sometimes the older he was the more highly he would prize such a gift vang khan it happened was old he was old enough to be temujin's father indeed he had been in the habit of calling temujin his son he had been in alliance with yezanke temujin's father some years before when temujin was quite a boy and it was at that time that he began to call him his son purda and vang khan accordingly when purda was brought to him by the messengers who had been sent in charge of her and presented to him in his tent he said she is very beautiful but i cannot take her for my wife for she is the wife of my son i cannot marry the wife of my son vang khan however received purda under his charge gave her a place in his household and took good care of her purda's return birth of her child 
when temujin returned home from his expedition and learned what had happened during his absence he was greatly distressed at the loss of his wife not long afterward he ascertained where she was and he immediately sent a deputation to vang khan asking him to send her home with this request vang khan immediately complied and purta set out on her return she was stopped on the way however by the birth of her child it was a son as soon as the child was born it was determined to continue the journey for there was danger if they delayed that some new troop of enemies might come up in which case purta would perhaps be made captive again so purta it is said wrapped up the tender limbs of the infant in some sort of paste or dough to save them from the effects of the jolting produced by the rough sort of cart in which she was compelled to ride and in that condition she held the babe in her lap all the way home Juki. she arrived at her husband's residence in safety temujin was overjoyed at seeing her again and he was particularly pleased with his little son who came out of his packing safe and sound in commemoration of his safe arrival after so strange and dangerous a journey his father named him safe arrived that is he gave him for a name the word in their language that means that the word itself was jughi temujin's wonderful dream the commencement of temujin's career was thus on the whole quite prosperous and everything seemed to promise well he was himself full of ambition and of hope and began to feel dissatisfied with the empire which his father had left him and to form plans for extending it he dreamed one night that his arms grew out to an enormous length and that he took a sword in each of them and stretched them out to see how far they would reach pointing one to the eastward and the other to the westward in the morning he related his dream to his mother she interpreted it to him she told him it meant undoubtedly that he was destined to become a great conqueror and that the directions in which his kingdom would be extended were toward the eastward and toward the westward disaffection among his subjects a rebellion temujin continued for about two years after this in prosperity and then his good fortune began to wane. there came a reaction some of the tribes under his dominion began to grow discontented the subordinate khans began to form plots and conspiracies even his own tribe turned against him rebellions broke out in various parts of his dominions and he was obliged to make many hurried expeditions here and there and to fight many desperate battles to suppress them in one of these contests he was taken prisoner he however contrived to make his escape he then made proposals to the disaffected khans which he hoped would satisfy them and bring them once more to submit to him since what he thus offered to do in these proposals was pretty much all that they had professed to require but the proposals did not satisfy them what they really intended to do was to depose temujin altogether and then either divide his dominions among themselves or select some one of their number to reign in his stead temujin discouraged at last temujin finding that he could not pacify his enemies and that they were moreover growing stronger every day while those that adhered to him were growing fewer in numbers and diminishing in strength became discouraged he began to think that perhaps he really was too young to rule over a kingdom composed of wandering hordes of men so warlike and wild and he concluded for a time to give up the attempt and wait until times should change or at least until he should be grown somewhat older accordingly in conjunction with his mother he formed a plan for retiring temporarily from the field unless indeed as we might reasonably suspect his mother formed the plan herself and by her influence over him induced him to adopt it temujin plans a temporary abdication the plan was this that temujin should send an ambassador to the court of vang khan to ask vang khan to receive him and protect him for a time in his dominions until the affairs of his own kingdom should become settled then if vang khan should accede to this proposal temujin was to appoint his uncle 
to act as regent during his absence his mother too was to be married to a certain emir or prince named menglik who was to be made prime minister under the regent and was to take precedence of all the other princes or khans in the kingdom the government was to be managed by the regent and the minister until such time as it should be deemed expedient for temujin to return arrangement of a regency temujin's departure this plan was carried into effect vang khan readily consented to receive temujin into his dominions and to protect him there he was very ready to do this he said on account of the friendship which he had borne for temujin's father temujin's mother was married to the emir and the emir was made the first prince of the realm finally temujin's uncle was proclaimed regent and duly invested with all necessary authority for governing the country until temujin's return these things being all satisfactorily arranged temujin set out for the country of vang khan at the head of an armed escort to protect him on the way of six thousand men he took with him all his family and a considerable suite of servants and attendants among them was his old tutor and guardian karasher the person who had been appointed by his father to take charge of him and to teach and train him when he was a boy being protected by so powerful an escort temujin's party were not molested on their journey and they all arrived safely at the court of vang khan End of chapter 4Chapter 5 of the History of Genghis Khan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Bosk. The History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 5 Vang Khan. 1175. The country over which Vang Khan ruled was called Kurakate. It bordered upon the country of Katay, which has already been mentioned as forming the northern part of what is now China. Indeed, as its name imports, it was considered in some sense as a portion of the same general district of country. It was that part of Katay which was inhabited by Tartars. Vang Khan was descended from a powerful line of Khans who had reigned over Karakate for many generations. These Khans were a wild and lawless race of men, continually fighting with each other, both for mastery and also for the plunder of each other's flocks and herds. In this way, most furious and cruel wars were often fought between near relatives. Vang Khan's grandfather, whose name was Murgus, was taken prisoner in one of these quarrels by another Khan, who, though he was a relative, was so much exasperated by something that Murgus had done, that he sent him away to a great distance to the king of a certain country, which is called Kurga, to be disposed of there. The king of Kurga put him into a sack, sewed up the mouth of it, and then laid him across the wooden image of an ass, and left him there to die of hunger and suffocation. The wife of Murgus was greatly enraged when she heard of the cruel fate of her husband. She determined to be revenged. It seems that the relative of her husband, who had taken him prisoner, and had sent him to the king of Kurga, had been her lover in former times before her marriage. So she sent him a message, in which she dissembled her grief for the loss of her husband, and only blamed the king of Kurga for his cruel death, and then said that she had long felt an affection for him, and that, if he continued of the same mind as when he had formerly addressed her, she was now willing to become his wife, and offered, if he would come to a certain place, which she specified, to meet her, she would join him there. Nar, for that was the chieftain's name, fell at once into the snare which the beautiful widow thus laid for him. He immediately accepted her proposals, and proceeded to the place of rendezvous. He went, of course, attended by a suitable guard, though his guard was small, and consisted chiefly of friends and personal attendants. The princess was attended also by a guard, not large enough, however, to excite any suspicion. She also took with her in her train a large number of carts, which were to be drawn by bullocks, 
and which were laden with stores of provisions clothing and other such valuables intended as a present for her new husband among these however there were a large number of great barrels or rounded receptacles of some sort in which she had concealed a considerable force of armed men these receptacles were so arranged that the men concealed in them could open them from within in an instant at a given signal and issue forth suddenly all armed and ready for action among the other stores which the princess had provided there was a large supply of a certain intoxicating drink which the mongols and tartars were accustomed to make in those days as soon as the two parties met at the place of rendezvous the princess gave nar a very cordial greeting and invited him and all his party to a feast to be partaken on the spot the invitation was accepted the stores of provisions were opened and many of the presents were unpacked and displayed at the feast nar and his party were all supplied abundantly with the intoxicating liquor which as is usual in such cases they were easily led to drink to excess while on the other hand the princess's party who knew what was coming took good care to keep themselves sober at length when the proper moment arrived the princess made the signal in an instant the men who had been placed in ambuscade in the barrels burst forth from their concealment and rushed upon the guests at the feast the princess herself who was all ready for action drew a dagger from her girdle and stabbed nar to the heart her guards assisted by the reinforcement which had so suddenly appeared slew or secured all his attendants who were so totally incapacitated partly by the drink which they had taken and partly by their astonishment at the sudden appearance of so overwhelming a force that they were incapable of making any resistance the princess having thus accomplished her revenge marshalled her men packed up her pretended presence and returned in triumph home such stories as these related by the asiatic writers though they were probably often much embellished in the narration had doubtless all some foundation in fact and they give us some faint idea of the modes of life and action which prevailed among these half-savage chieftains in those times vang khan himself was the grandson of mergus who was sewed up in a sack his father was the oldest son of the princess who contrived the above narrated stratagem to revenge her husband's death it is said that he used to accompany his father to the wars when he was only ten years old the way in which he formed his friendship for Yezankai, and the alliance with him which led him to call Temujin his son, and to refuse to take his wife away from him, as already related, was this. When his father died, he succeeded to the command, being the oldest son. But the others were jealous of him, and after many and long quarrels with them, and with other relatives, especially with his uncle, who seemed to take the lead against him, he was at last overpowered or outmaneuvered, and was obliged to fly. He took refuge, in his distress, in the country of Yezenkai. Yezenkai received him in a very friendly manner, and gave him effectual protection. After a time he furnished him with troops, and helped him to recover his kingdom, and to drive his uncle away into banishment in his turn. It was while he was thus in Yezenkai's dominions that he became acquainted with Temujin, who was then very small, and it was there that he learned to call him his son. Of course, now that Temujin was obliged to fly himself from his native country, and abandon his hereditary dominions, as he had done before, he was glad of the opportunity of requiting to the son the favor which he had received, in precisely similar circumstances, from the father and so he gave temujin a very kind reception there is another circumstance which is somewhat curious in respect to vang khan and that is that he is generally supposed to be the prince whose fame was about this period spread all over europe under the name of prester john by the christian missionaries in asia these missionaries sent to the pope and to various christian kings in europe very exaggerated accounts of the success of their missions among the persians turks and tartars and at last they wrote word that the great khan of the tartars had become a convert and had even become a preacher of the gospel and had taken the name of prester john the word prester was understood to be a corruption of presbyter a great deal was accordingly written and said all through christendom about the great tartar convert prester john 
there were several letters forwarded by the missionaries professedly from him and addressed to the pope and to the different kings of europe some of these letters it is said are still in existence one of them was to the king of france in this letter the writer tells the king of france of his great wealth and of the vastness of his dominions he says he has seventy kings to serve and wait upon him he invites the king of france to come and see him promising to bestow a great kingdom upon him if he will and also to make him his heir and leave all his dominions to him when he dies with a great deal more of the same general character the other letters were much the same and the interest which they naturally excited was increased by the accounts which the missionaries gave of the greatness and renown of this more than royal convert and of the progress which christianity had made and was still making in his dominions through their instrumentality it is supposed in modern times that these stories were pretty much all inventions on the part of the missionaries or at least that the accounts which they sent were greatly exaggerated and embellished and there is but little doubt that they had much more to do with the authorship of the letters than any con still however it is supposed that there was a great prince who at least encouraged the missionaries in their work and allowed them to preach christianity in his dominions and if so there is little doubt that van con was the man at all events he was a very great and powerful prince and he reigned over a wide extent of country the name of his capital was karakorum the distance which temujin had to travel to reach this city was about ten days journey he was received by van con with great marks of kindness and consideration van con promised to protect him and in due time to assist him in recovering his kingdom in the meanwhile temujin promised to enter at once into van con's service and to devote himself faithfully to promoting the interests of his kind protector by every means in his power End of chapter 5chapter six of the history of genghis khan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by thomas bosk the history of genghis khan by jacob abbott chapter six temujin in exile eleven eighty two van khan gave temujin a very honorable position in his court it was natural that he should do so for temujin was a prince in the prime of his youth and of very attractive person and manners and though he was for the present an exile as it were from his native land he was not by any means in a destitute or hopeless condition his family and friends were still in the ascendancy at home and he himself in coming to the kingdom of van khan had brought with him quite an important body of troops being at the same time personally possessed of great courage and of much military skill he was prepared to render his protector good service in return for his protection in a word the arrival of temujin at the court of van khan was an event calculated to make quite a sensation at first everybody was very much pleased with him and he was very popular but before long the other young princes of the court and the chieftains of the neighboring tribes began to be jealous of him van khan gave him precedence over them all partly on account of his personal attachment to him and partly on account of the rank which he held in his own country which being that of a sovereign prince naturally entitled him to the very highest position among the subordinate chieftains in the retinue of van khan but these subordinate chieftains were not satisfied they murmured at first secretly and afterward more openly and soon began to form combinations and plots against the new favorite as they called him an incident soon occurred which greatly increased this animosity and gave to temujin's enemies all at once a very powerful leader and head this leader was a very influential chieftain named yamuka this yamuka it seems was in love with the daughter of van khan the princess wisulijin he asked her in marriage of her father to precisely what state of forwardness the negotiations had advanced does not appear but at any rate when temujin arrived 
with Sulujin, soon began to turn her thoughts toward him. He was undoubtedly younger, handsomer, and more accomplished than her old lover, and before long she gave her father to understand that she would much rather have him for her husband than Yamuka. It is true, Temujin had one or two wives already, but this made no difference, for it was the custom then, as indeed it is still, for the Asiatic princes and chieftains to take as many wives as their wealth and position would enable them to maintain. Yamuka was accordingly refused, and Wasulujin was given in marriage to Temujin. Yamuka was, of course, dreadfully enraged. He vowed that he would be revenged. He immediately began to intrigue with all the discontented persons and parties in the kingdom, not only with those who were envious and jealous of Temujin, but also with those who, for any reason, were disposed to put themselves in opposition to Vang Khan's government. Thus a formidable conspiracy was formed for the purpose of compassing Temujin's ruin. The conspirators first tried the effect of private remonstrances with Vang Khan, in which they made all sorts of evil representations against Temujin, but to no effect. Temujin rallied about him so many old friends, and made so many new friends by his courage and energy, that his party at court proved stronger than that of his enemies, and for a time they seemed likely to fail entirely of their design. At length the conspirators opened communication with the foreign enemies of Vang Khan, and formed a league with them to make war against and destroy both Vang Khan and Temujin together. The accounts of the process of this league, and of the different nations and tribes which took part in it, is imperfect and confused. But at length, after various preliminary contests and maneuvers, arrangements were made for assembling a large army with a view of invading Vang Khan's dominions and deciding the question by a battle. The different chieftains and khans whose troops were united to form this army bound themselves together by a solemn oath, according to the customs of those times, not to rest until both Vang Khan and Temujin should be destroyed. The manner in which they took the oath was this. They brought out into an open space on the plain where they had assembled to take the oath, a horse, a wild ox, and a dog. At a given signal they fell upon these animals with their swords, and cut them all to pieces in the most furious manner. When they had finished, they stood together and called out aloud in the following words. Hear, O God, O heaven, O earth, the oath that we swear against Van Khan and Temujin. If any one of us spares them when we have them in our power, or if we fail to keep the promise that we have made to destroy them, may we meet with the same fate that has befallen these beasts that we have now cut to pieces. They uttered this imprecation in a very solemn manner, standing among the mangled and bloody remains of the beasts which lay strewed all about the ground. These preparations had been made thus far very secretly, but tidings of what was going on came before a great while, to Karakorum, Vang Khan's capital. Temujin was greatly excited when he heard the news. He immediately proposed that he should take his own troops and join with them as many of Vang Khan's soldiers as could be conveniently spared, and go forth to meet the enemy. To this Vang Khan consented. Temujin took one half of Vang Khan's troops to join his own, leaving the other half to protect the capital, and so set forth on his expedition. He went off in the direction toward the frontier where he had understood the principal part of the hostile forces were assembling. After a long march, probably one of many days, he arrived there before the enemy was quite prepared for him. Then followed a series of maneuvers and counter-maneuvers in which Temujin was all the time endeavoring to bring the rebels to battle, while they were doing all in their power to avoid it. Their object in this delay was to gain time for reinforcements to come in consisting of bodies of troops belonging to certain members of the League who had not yet arrived. At length, when these maneuvers were brought to an end, and the battle was about to be fought, Temujin and his whole army were one day greatly surprised to see his father-in-law, Vang Khan himself, coming into the camp at the head of a small and forlorn-looking band of followers, who had all the appearance of fugitives escaped from a battle. They looked anxious, wayworn, and exhausted and the horses that they rode seemed wholly spent with fatigue and privation. On explanation, Temujin learned that, as soon as it was known that he had left the capital, and taken with him a large part of the army, 
a certain tribe of van Khan's enemies living in another direction had determined to seize the opportunity to invade his dominions and had accordingly come suddenly in with an immense horde to attack the capital van Khan had done all that he could to defend the city but he had been overpowered the greater part of his soldiers had been killed or wounded the city had been taken and pillaged his son with those of the troops that had been able to save themselves had escaped to the mountains as to van Khan himself he had thought it best to make his way as soon as possible to the camp of temujin where he had now arrived after enduring great hardships and sufferings on the way temujin was at first much amazed at hearing this story he however bade his father-in-law not to be cast down or discouraged and promised him full revenge and a complete triumph over all his enemies at the coming battle so he proceeded at once to complete his arrangements for the coming fight he resigned to van Khan the command of the main body of the army while he placed himself at the head of one of the wings assigning the other to the chieftain next in rank in his army in this order he went to battle the battle was a very obstinate and bloody one but in the end temujin's party was victorious the troops opposed to him were defeated and driven off the field the victory appeared to be due altogether to temujin himself for after the struggle had continued a long time and the result still appeared doubtful the troops of temujin's wing finally made a desperate charge and forced their way with such fury into the midst of the forces of the enemy that nothing could withstand them this encouraged and animated the other troops to such a degree that very soon the enemy were entirely routed and driven from off the field the effect of this victory was to raise the reputation of temujin as a military commander higher than ever and greatly to increase the confidence which van Khan was inclined to repose in him the victory too seemed at first to have well-nigh broken up the party of the rebels still the way was not yet open for van Khan to return and take possession of his throne and of his capital for he learned that one of his brothers had assumed the government and was reigning in karakorum in his place it would seem that this brother whose name was erkakara had been one of the leaders of the party opposed to temujin it was natural that he should be so for being the brother of the king he would of course occupy a very high position in the court and would be one of the first to experience the ill effects produced by the coming in of any new favorite he had accordingly joined in the plots that were formed against temujin and van Khan. indeed he was considered in some respects as the head of their party and when van Khan was driven away from his capital this brother assumed the throne in his stead the question was how could he now be dispossessed and van Khan restored temujin began immediately to form his plans for the accomplishment of this purpose he concentrated his forces after the battle and soon afterward opened negotiations with other tribes who had before been uncertain which side to espouse but were now assisted a great deal in coming to a decision by the victory which temujin had obtained in the meantime the rebels were not idle they banded themselves together anew and made great exertions to procure reinforcements Erkakara fortified himself as strongly as possible in Karakorum, and collected ample supplies of ammunition and military stores. It was not until the following year that the parties had completed their preparations and were prepared for the final struggle. Then, however, another great battle was fought, and again Temujin was victorious. Erkakara was killed or driven away in his turn. Karakorum was retaken and van Khan entered it in triumph at the head of his troops and was once more established on his throne of course the rank and influence of temujin at his court was now higher than ever before he was now about twenty-two or twenty-three years of age he had already three wives though it is not certain that all of them were with him at van Khan's court he was extremely popular in the army as young commanders of great courage and spirit almost always are van Khan placed great reliance upon him and lavished upon him all possible honors he does not seem however yet to have begun to form any plans for returning to his native land end of chapter six chapter seven of the history of genghis khan 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Bosk. The History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 7 Rupture with Vang Khan. 1182 to 1202. Temujin remained at the court, or in the dominions of Vang Khan, for a great many years. During the greater portion of this time, he continued in the service of Vang Khan, and on good terms with him, though in the end, as we shall presently see, their friendship was turned into a bitter enmity. Erkakara, Vang Khan's brother, who had usurped his throne during the rebellion, was killed, it was said, at the time when Vang Khan recovered his throne. Several of the other rebel chieftains were also killed, but some of them succeeded in saving themselves from utter ruin, and in gradually recovering their former power over the hordes which they respectively commanded. It must be remembered that the country was not divided at this time into regular territorial states and kingdoms, but was rather one vast undivided region, occupied by immense hordes, each of which was more or less stationary, it is true, in its own district or range, but was nevertheless without any permanent settlement. The various clans drifted slowly this way and that among the plains and mountains, as the prospects of pasturage, the fortune of war, or the pressure of conterminous hordes might incline them. In cases, too, where a number of hordes were united under one general chieftain, as was the case with those over whom Van Khan claimed to have sway, the tie by which they were bound together was very feeble and the distinction between a state of submission and of rebellion, except in case of actual war, was very slightly defined. Yamuka, the chieftain who had been so exasperated against Temujin on account of his being supplanted by him in the affections of the young princess, Van Khan's daughter, whom Temujin had married for his third wife, succeeded in making his escape at the time when Van Khan conquered his enemies and recovered his throne. For a time he concealed himself or at least kept out of Van Khan's reach, by dwelling with hordes whose range was at some distance from Karakorum. He soon, however, contrived to open secret negotiations with one of Van Khan's sons, whose name was something that sounded like Sankum. Some authors, in attempting to represent his name in our letters, spelled it Sungim. Yamuka easily persuaded this young Sankum to take sides with him in the quarrel. It was natural that he should do so, for, being the son of Van Khan, he was in some measure displaced from his own legitimate and proper position at his father's court by the great and constantly increasing influence which Temujin exercised. And besides, said Yamuka, in the secret representations which he made to Sankum, this newcomer is not only interfering with and curtailing your proper influence and consideration now, but his design is by and by to circumvent and supplant you altogether. He is forming plans for making himself your father's heir, and so robbing you of your rightful inheritance. Sankum listened very eagerly to these suggestions, and finally it was agreed between him and Yamuka that Sankum should exert his influence with his father to obtain permission for Yamuka to come back to court, and to be received again into his father's service, under pretense of having repented of his rebellion, and of being now disposed to return to his allegiance. Sankum did this, and after a time, Van Khan was persuaded to allow Yamuka to return. Thus a sort of outward peace was made, but it was no real peace. Yamuka was as envious and jealous of Temujin as ever, and now, moreover, in addition to this envy and jealousy, he felt the stimulus of revenge. Things, however, seemed to have gone on very quietly for a time, or at least without any open outbreak in the court. During this time, Van Khan was, as usual with such princes, frequently engaged in wars with the neighboring hordes. In these wars he relied a great deal on Temujin. Temujin was in command of a large body of troops, which consisted in part of his own guard, the troops that had come with him from his own country, and in part of other bands of men whom Van Khan had placed under his orders, or who had joined him of their own accord. He was assisted in the command of this body by four subordinate generals, or khans, whom he called his four intrepids. They were all very brave and skillful commanders. At the head of this troop, 
Temujin was accustomed to scour the country, hunting out Van Khan's enemies, or making long expeditions over distant plains or among the mountains, in the prosecution of Van Khan's warlike projects, whether those of invasion and plunder, or of retaliation and vengeance. Temujin was extremely popular with the soldiers who served under him. Soldiers always love a dashing, fearless, and energetic leader, who has the genius to devise brilliant schemes, and the spirit to execute them in a brilliant manner. They care very little how dangerous the situations are into which he may lead them. Those that get killed in performing the exploits which he undertakes cannot speak to complain, and those who survive are only so much the better pleased that the dangers that they have been brought safely through were so desperate and that the harvest of glory which they have thereby acquired is so great. Temujin, though a great favorite with his own men, was, like almost all half-savage warriors of his class, utterly merciless when he was angry in his treatment of his enemies. It is said that, after one of his battles, in which he had gained a complete victory over an immense horde of rebels and other foes, and had taken great numbers of them prisoners, he ordered fires to be built, and seventy large cauldrons of water to be put over them. And then, when the water was boiling hot, he caused the principal leaders of the vanquished army to be thrown in headlong and thus scalded to death. Then he marched at once into the country of the enemy, and there took all the women and children, and sent them off to be sold as slaves, and seized the cattle and other property which he found, and carried it off as plunder. In thus taking possession of the enemy's property and making it his own, and selling the poor captives into slavery, there was nothing remarkable. Such was the custom of the times. But the act of scalding his prisoners to death seems to denote or reveal in his character a vein of peculiar and atrocious cruelty. It is possible, however, that the story may not be true. It may have been invented by Yamuka and Sankum, or by some of his other enemies. For Yamuka and Sankum, and others who were combined with them, were continually endeavoring to undermine Temujin's influence with Van Khan, and thus deprive him of his power. But he was too strong for them. His great success in all his military undertakings kept him up in spite of all that his rivals could do to pull him down. As for Van Khan himself, he was in part pleased with him and proud of him, and in part he feared him. He was very unwilling to be so dependent upon a subordinate chieftain, and yet he could not do without him. A king never desires that any one of his subjects should become too conspicuous or too great, and Van Khan would have been very glad to have diminished in some way the power and prestige which Temujin had acquired, and which seemed to be increasing every day. He, however, found no means of effecting this in any quiet and peaceful manner. Temujin was at the head of his troops, generally away from Karakorum, where Van Khan resided, and he was, in a great measure, independent. He raised his own recruits to keep the numbers of his army good, and it was always easy to subsist if there chanced to be any failure in the ordinary and regular supplies. Besides, occasions were continually occurring in which Van Khan wished for Temujin's aid, and could not dispense with it. At one time, while engaged in some important campaigns, far away among the mountains, Yamuka contrived to awaken so much distress of Temujin in Van Kong's mind that Van Khan secretly decamped in the night, and marched away to a distant place to save himself from a plot which Yamuka had told him that Temujin was contriving. Here, however, he was attacked by a large body of his enemies, and was reduced to such straits that he was obliged to send couriers off at once to Temujin to come with his intrepids and save him. Temujin came. He rescued Van Khan from his danger, and drove his enemies away. Van Khan was very grateful for this service, so that the two friends became entirely reconciled to each other, and were united more closely than ever, greatly to Yamuka's disappointment and chagrin. They made a new league of amity, and to seal and confirm it, they agreed upon a double marriage between their two families. A son of Temujin was to be married to a daughter of Van Khan, and a son of Van Khan to a daughter of Temujin. This new compact did not, however, last long. As soon as Van Khan found that the danger from which Temujin had rescued him was past, he began again to listen to the representations of Yamuka and Sankum. 
who still insisted that Temujin was a very dangerous man, and was by no means to be trusted. They said that he was ambitious and unprincipled, and that he was only waiting for a favorable opportunity to rebel himself against Vang Khan and depose him from his throne. They made a great many statements to the Khan in confirmation of their opinion, some of which were true, doubtless, but many were exaggerated, and others probably false. They, however, succeeded at last in making such an impression upon the Khan's mind that he finally determined to take measures for putting Temujin out of the way. Accordingly, on some pretext or other, he contrived to send Temujin away from Karakoram, his capital, for Temujin was so great a favorite with the royal guards and with all the garrison of the town that he did not dare to undertake anything openly against him there. Vang Khan also sent a messenger to Temujin's own country to persuade the chief persons there to join him in his plot. It will be recollected that, at the time when Temujin left his own country, when he was about fourteen years old, his mother had married a great chieftain there, named Menglik, and that this Menglik, in conjunction doubtless with Temujin's mother, had been made regent during his absence. Vang Khan now sent to Menglik to propose that he should unite with him to destroy Temujin. You have no interest, said Vang Khan in the message that he sent to Menglik, in taking his part. It is true that you have married his mother, but personally he is nothing to you, and if he is once out of the way, you will be acknowledged as the Grand Khan of the Mongols in your own right, whereas you now hold your place in subordination to him, and he may at any time return and set you aside altogether. Vang Khan hoped by these arguments to induce Menglik to come and assist him in his plan of putting Temujin to death, or, at least, if Menglik would not assist him in perpetrating the deed, he thought that, by these arguments, he should induce him to be willing that it should be committed, so that he should himself have nothing to fear afterward from his resentment. But Menglik received the proposal in a very different way from what Vang Khan had expected. He said nothing, but he determined immediately to let Temujin know of the danger that he was in. He accordingly at once set to go out to Temujin's camp to inform him of Vang Khan's designs. In the meantime, Vang Khan, having matured his plans, made an appointment for Temujin to meet him at a certain place designated for the purpose of consummating the double marriage between their children, which had been before agreed upon. Temujin, not suspecting any treachery, received and entertained the messenger in a very honorable manner, and said that he would come. After making the necessary preparations, he set out in company with the messenger, and with a grand retinue of his own attendants, to go to the place appointed. On his way, he was met or overtaken by Menglik, who had come to warn him of his danger. As soon as Temujin had heard what his stepfather had to say, he made some excuse for postponing the journey, and, sending a civil answer to Vang Khan by the ambassador, he ordered him to go forward, and went back himself to his own camp. This camp was at some distance from Karakoram, Vang Khan, as has already been stated, had sent Temujin away from the capital on account of his being so great a favorite that he was afraid of some tumult if he were to attempt anything against him there. Temujin was, however, pretty strong in his camp. The troops that usually attended him there, with four intrepids as commanders of the four principal divisions of them. His old instructor and guardian, Karashur, was with him too. Karashur, it seems, had continued in Temujin's service up to this time, and was accustomed to accompany him in all his expeditions as his counselor and friend. When Van Kong learned, by the return of his messenger, that Temujin declined to come to the place of rendezvous which he had appointed, he concluded at once that he suspected treachery, and he immediately decided that he must now strike a decisive blow without any delay, otherwise Temujin would put himself more and more on his guard. He was not mistaken, it seems, however, in thinking how great a favorite Temujin was at Karakoram, for his secret design was betrayed to Temujin by two of his servants, who overheard him speak of it to one of his wives. Vang Khan's plan was to go out secretly to Temujin's camp at the head of an armed force superior to his, and there come upon him and his whole troop suddenly, by surprise, in the night, by which means, he thought, he should easily overpower the whole encampment and either kill Temujin and his generals, or else make them prisoners. The two men who betrayed this plan were slaves, 
who were employed to take care of the horses of some person connected with Van Khan's household, and to render various other services. Their names were Badu and Kishlik. It seems that these men were one day carrying some milk to Van Khan's house or tent, and there they overheard a conversation between Van Khan and his wife, by which they learned the particulars of the plan formed for Temujin's destruction. The expedition was to set out, they heard, on the following morning. It is not at all surprising that they overheard this conversation. For not only the tents, but even the houses used by these Asiatic nations were built of very frail and thin materials, and the partitions were often made of canvas and felt, and other such substances as could have very little power to intercept sound. The two slaves determined to proceed at once to Temujin's camp, and warn him of his danger. So they stole away from their quarters at nightfall, and, after traveling diligently all night, in the morning they reached the camp and told Temujin what they had learned. Temujin was surprised, but he had been, in some measure, prepared for such intelligence by the communication which his stepfather had made him in respect to Van Khan's treacherous designs a few days before. He immediately summoned Karasher and some of his other friends, in order to consult in respect to what it was best to do. It was resolved to elude Van Khan's design by means of a stratagem. He was to come upon them, according to the account of the slaves, that night. The preparations for receiving him were consequently to be made at once. The plan was for Temujin and all his troops to withdraw from the camp and conceal themselves in a place of ambuscade nearby. They were to leave a number of men behind, who, when night came on, were to set the lights and replenish the fires and put everything in such condition as to make it appear that the troops were all there. Their expectation was that, when Van Khan should arrive, he would make his assault according to his original design, and then, while his forces were in the midst of the confusion incident to such an onset, Temujin was to come forth from his ambuscade and fall upon them. In this way he hoped to conquer them and put them to flight, although he had every reason to suppose that the force which Van Khan would bring out against him would be considerably stronger in numbers than his own. End of chapter 7